So good morning, welcome to those of you in person and those of you uh, dialed in by Zoom. Um, I want to introduce Mark Ganzi, uh, who's gonna give us about a half hour of comments uh, about a lot of interesting topics globally. He's the CEO of Digital Bridge. Mark is somebody I've known for a couple of decades. He's been active as an operator um, and made a lot of money uh, for investors and uh, helped build up um, a major tower platform before selling that to American Tower. And since then he's been, um, and throughout that time he's been active with a number of um, major financial sponsors. Now he and the team of Digital Bridge are essentially their own financial sponsor, active in a lot of areas of digital infrastructure, fiber, towers, small cells, data centers, and cloud infrastructure um, across all global regions. So it's a company that you've heard quite a lot about. But without further ado, I'd like to kick it off to Mark to um, tell the story and give some views as to how he sees the uh, future unfolding across digital infrastructure. Welcome, Mark. Good morning, everybody. Aloha. Hello. Welcome to PTC. I'm delighted to be here, albeit virtually. Uh, certainly was hoping to be there in person, but COVID had other plans for me as uh, we learned to live in a very different environment. But uh, hopefully um, we'll all be together uh, next year, those of us that had to attend virtually. Really an honor and a privilege uh, to be here today to talk about something that um, is really, from my perspective, the, the topic of discussion that I think we'll be talking about for the next decade in the physical part of digital infrastructure, which is edge computing. And I really wanted to spend today talking about what we're seeing and what we're, what we're experiencing with our customers and certainly what we're experiencing with our portfolio companies and, and share our view of the future and the vision of what we think will happen um, in the near future around edge facilities and where customers most importantly um, are taking infrastructure. So, um, one, I want to give you a quick introduction to who we are. Some of you don't know who Digital Bridge is, so I wanted to share where we are in our journey uh, for a couple of minutes, then talk about some of the demand currents that we're seeing in the sector today, and then really take a step back and talk about network architecture, which we think is arguably the most important part of what we're doing today. So with that, let's get right into the materials and just a little bit about Digital Bridge. Who are we? What are we? Uh, we're a global digital infrastructure firm. Um, we operate on a global basis at scale, investing across what we believe are the five sort of pillars of digital infrastructure. Data centers, of course, cell towers, fiber networks, small cells, and edge infrastructure, which we'll talk a lot about today. Um, just a couple of metrics about us by the numbers. Um, as of the end of the third quarter of last year, we had about 40 billion of assets under management. We continued to grow our assets under management in the fourth quarter. And we have earnings in a couple of weeks. We'll share uh, how much growth that we were able to accomplish in that time period. We have 23 portfolio companies. Um, we've recently made announcements around our 24th and 25th platforms, one in Asia and one in Latin America, which we'll announce in our next quarter's earnings. And then we have over 100 digital infrastructure professionals um, spread across the globe from Singapore to New York, to Los Angeles, to London, Paris, and uh, right here in uh, Boca Raton, Florida today. And as I mentioned earlier, we invest across the entire ecosystem. Um, and it's really a unique investment strategy. There's no other firm in the world that invests with the depth and the scope at which Digital Ridge invests today. It's a portfolio that gives investors exposure to all of the key resilient businesses that are enabling the next generation of mobile and internet infrastructure. So as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna talk a little bit about edge infrastructure today and, and really try to put some, some, some real parameters around that definition. Edge infrastructure is really addressing customers' needs at the perimeter of their network. So it's not just data centers. It involves fiber networks, it involves cell towers, and it also involves, involves small cell uh, network architecture as well. So at the end of the day, you know, our team, we have the largest dedicated digital infrastructure investment team in the world. Um, we're focused on what we believe are the most powerful secular trends by investing in what we think are businesses that will produce strong revenue, 
with what we would call predictable earnings aligned with those secular tailwinds. And then last but not least, we're the only digital read out there that's investing in a converged ecosystem that's built for low latency and high compute performance. So as I mentioned earlier, we are investing today on a global scale. Um, we do think that this business is a global business. And by being the leading digital infrastructure investment firm with great operational expertise and a global presence, it enables us to work for customers anywhere in the world at any time. And our, our lineage goes back to 1994. We've been operating in the space for over 28 years, starting in the mobile infrastructure space where we built towers, going back to Apex Site Management, SpectraSite, Global Tower Partners, and now Vertical Bridge. And alongside of Vertical Bridge, we have seven other tower companies around the globe. Data centers continues to be our most active sector in terms of new investment. Most recently out of our second fund, we've invested in Vantage Asia Pack, which is the combination of PCCW, Agile, and Vantage coming together to form what we believe is a powerful combination to invest in Asia Pack digital infrastructure, specifically hyperscale data centers. DataBank, which is our domestic US edge compute business has over 60 facilities across 25 metro areas. And in addition to that, we also have Atlas Edge, which was recently formed in Europe with a great management team and the backing of Liberty Global and Scala data centers based in Sao Paulo, Brazil, which is focused on hyperscale deployments across Latin America. It's an expansive data center portfolio. We have over 300 data center locations around the world today. Fiber, we're one of the largest private fiber owners in the US and Europe. Our flagship investment, Zeo, is also aided by investments in Beanfield, and most recently, our combination with Columbia Capital to form Superloop Asia Pack, which is a business that's focused on investing in fiber infrastructure, long haul and wholesale infrastructure throughout the region. And then in edge infrastructure, we mentioned, of course, our investment, Atlas Edge, but in addition to that, we also have other edge businesses, Freshwave Group, which has hubs for small cell infrastructure throughout the UK, and of course, uh, our business Extinet based in Chicago, which actually today has over 860 CRAN hubs, which are also edge compute sites. So we literally invest across the entire ecosystem. We have over 30,000 cell towers, 95,000 small cells, almost 300 data center locations, 135,000 miles of fiber, and over 100 edge locations. And when you factor in our CRAN hubs at Extinet, we almost have a thousand edge locations. So it's a pretty expansive portfolio and one where we feel like the most important thing is we can show up for customers on a global basis. So I talked about demand earlier. You know, we're obviously really excited about the demand trends today in our sector. And everyone attending this conference, attending PTC this year should also be equally excited. Why? Because our, our, our sector is literally transforming right now. As I mentioned earlier, I've been doing this for three decades, going back to the early 1990s. And this for me is one of the most exciting eras in digital infrastructure. Why is that? It's really simple. The old way of investing in building digital infrastructure was a very siloed and myopic approach to investing. You had to be captive in one swim lane, whether it was towers, data centers, fiber, small cell infrastructure that was really oriented at mobile networks and enterprise compute. Today, I would offer to you that the world is changing. It was changing pre-pandemic, it's forever changed in the midstream of the pandemic, and it'll continue to change post-pandemic. The secular trends that we're investing in for the next decade are pretty simple. It's the same things that all of you are investing in today. First and foremost is around digital transformation, which is being enabled by the cloud. There's 1.3 trillion of global data center CapEx being spent right now. It is absolutely stunning. And all of you will experience this in the meetings that you're gonna have over the next few days, talking to customers, talking to competitors, talking to suppliers. Um, it's an unprecedented amount of demand today for working for web scalers and working for cloud providers. 5G, uh, I'm very excited about 5G. This is literally the fifth network topology that I've built in 30 years. And this one's pretty exciting and it's pretty complicated. We're estimating that there's 1.1 trillion of CapEx that's in the process of being spent right now to build 5G networks, which will be 
the lowest latency, fastest mobile networks we've ever built, which requires massive densification, macros, and fiber infrastructure that's all fed not from a backhaul architecture, but really in a software-defined environment where we're front-hauling network infrastructure for the first time. It's a pretty radical shift in network topology, and it requires converged solutions. You can't just go build a 5G network with macro towers and putting base stations at the bottom of those towers. It's a lot more complicated. ORAN and CLAN solutions are driven from the data center. They're driven from a hub and spoke network that is front hauled from those that ran architecture through dark fiber out to small cell, Wi-Fi, and macro infrastructure. It's literally the test of the entire digital infrastructure ecosystem. And it's pretty exciting and will impact everything that we're doing as 5G is the opportunity to marry mobile infrastructure with applications. Artificial intelligence. Most of the folks that are attending this conference that own data center infrastructure or build it are building for applications and service providers that are enabling the next generation of AI. And then last but not least, the internet of things. For us, this is very much tied to where 5G infrastructure is going, and we'll talk about it in a second, but we're moving from a world where we had literally 20 to 30 billion connections to 500 billion connected devices, literally over the next eight years. It's a hyper-converged environment. You can no longer sit in one swim lane. You have to understand network topology, network architecture, your customers, where they're going, and how do you execute for them. At our business today at Digital Bridge, we're building those next generation networks to serve what we believe is a highly converged ecosystem. So as I mentioned, we are investing in the future and our business has changed a lot in the last eight years. Most of you know us as, princi as a principal in platforms. I mentioned the 23 businesses going to 25 businesses over this quarter. We are predominantly an equity investor. We invest, we build, we operate across the digital infrastructure ecosystem. We also provide capital to businesses that wish to have an alternative form of credit. This is a new sleeve for us and a new team that we put in place two years ago, but we provide expansion capital to companies that are trying to find their way to get to scale or are trying to find ways to grow without having, addition, without having to issue additional equity. We've already done seven loans across the digital infrastructure ecosystem. We plan to have a significant amount of new capital this year to invest in credit, and we'll be a very active owner of credit solutions in the marketplace. And last but not least, we have two strategies where we manage public securities, and we're an active buyer and trader in digital infrastructure equities. Our digital, our digital Bridge Alpha Fund, led by Alan Bezoza, is a long strategy. Digital Bridge Liquid Solutions is run by Bill Hughes and his team, and they're focused on a more opportunistic hedge fund strategy. So whether it's public equities, credit, or private equity, we're invested across the entire ecosystem. Most importantly, we have capital to put to work for any situation. So I wanna talk about the demand and the setup for why we're excited about investing in the sector today. I mentioned mobility because it's really where my roots started in the early 90s. But one thing I've learned in building networks for mobile carriers, they want more, they want it better, and they want it faster. That adage has held true for 28 years. 5G is pretty exciting because I do believe it's the first time where mobility and cloud will, will collide. And demand for connectivity is driving that need for significant and persistent investment in digital infrastructure. First, it starts with the notion that mobile data traffic will continue to grow. And we believe through the advent of 5G networks and putting those applications and enabling them in a software defined environment will only increase mobile network data traffic. And we believe that'll increase by almost fivefold. This is a significant amount of capacity that'll be needed to meet these demands on the mobile networks. As I mentioned earlier, 1.3 trillion will be spent in data center CapEx. We're right in the middle of that at the beginning innings. As you can see here in 22 through 2026, there'll be a consistent $200 billion spend by our customers in hyperscale, but also non-hyperscale as well, as we build out edge infrastructure 
and we redefine what enterprise co-location means. Mobile CapEx will be persistent and it'll be long over the next five years. We actually believe that 5G is an eight year build. We just started building 5G last year, which was 2021. So we believe by 2028, 5G networks will be about 90% penetrated and built. This is almost a trillion dollars of CapEx. Obviously North America leads the way, but as you can see, Asia PAC, Europe, and other parts of the world are also equal contributors in terms of that CapEx that needs to be spent. So not only is it just data centers and mobile infrastructure, but the entire ecosystem is growing. We believe over $400 billion of annual CapEx will be needed to meet the demands of future network infrastructure. So in connection with mobile CapEx and cloud CapEx and enterprise colo CapEx and edge CapEx, we think there's an addition to that fiber, small cells, and other forms of digital infrastructure investment. This is a massive opportunity, and it's a huge opportunity for everyone here in the room today and those of you watching. I mentioned IoT. This is important. It's important because it's the beginning of driving capacity and driving data and infrastructure to the edge of the networks. IoT is one of the key leaders that we believe will drive and fuel edge capacity. As I mentioned earlier, almost two years ago, a little less than two years ago, we had about 20 billion of connected IoT devices. Today, 80 billion of connected devices within three years. And by the end of this decade, 500 billion connected devices. Much of this work is already happening today. Many of our portfolio companies are already working with enterprises that are building these next generation IoT networks. It's not only just the mobile carriers, it's enterprises, it's governments, for example, like DOTs. Many of the IoT networks that we're building today are situated and oriented at either states or counties or municipalities. Private enterprise, we're building out IoT networks for the likes of car manufacturers, people that operate ports, uh, utility companies is our biggest vertical in IoT today. And it's only going to grow as you need more sensors to deliver the promise of not only IoT, but artificial intelligence around autonomous vehicles, autonomous shipping, autonomous cranes, and everything else that can be done virtually and through 5G infrastructure. So to make all that work, you not only need the fiber and the antennas and the devices themselves, but you need the intelligence. You need the network intelligence out at the edge. We believe that 1.6 million servers will be moved to the edge over the next six years which represents roughly about 10% of cloud workloads. So while most of those big workloads will sit in the AZs, in the large areas where we're building hyperscale campuses, a, a significant chunk of that network intelligence will sit at the edge. And we'll talk about what the edge is here in a second. But we think this is one of the great trends that's fueling the early innings of 5G and edge computing. So, how will the new network architecture shape data-centric networks of tomorrow? So for us, growth in IoT devices, as I said earlier, just is the beginning, is the precipice in terms of generating new data. Network demands will continue to shift through this decade. The proliferation of IoT devices only helps move compute and applications further away from CBDs and traditional availability zones. We see a lot of growth, not only with new and emerging use cases, but actually the devices themselves. And really at the end of the day, this isn't about consumer to consumer connections. This is really about machine to machine connections, B2B or E2E, enterprise to enterprise, but mostly getting away from consumer. And most of the devices that'll sit on those networks will have very little human interaction, truth be told. IoT empowers really key three technologies from our perspective. I mentioned artificial intelligence earlier. One of our big case studies is we are building a next generation private CBRS network at one of the major shipping ports in the United States. And most of that network has little to do with the people that work at the port or the human beings that operate the port. It has everything to do with identifying with the sensors, the cranes, the ships, the SKU codes that sit on each individual shipping container, and ultimately trying to figure out through workflows and through processes, how to move goods and services faster 
without actually even touching a human being, which is a pretty exciting and different project. 5G, all three major mobile carriers in the fourth entrant are all focused on IoT infrastructure and mostly IoT infrastructure and how it impacts the enterprise. And then last but not least, big data analytics. We have to continue to gather network intelligence. And the only way you do that is through IoT sensors. Really, 5G enables the liftoff of many of these IoT use cases. We've talked about industry. We've talked about governments and municipalities. But also, this hits the consumer. It hits the consumer in wearables, and it hits the consumers at home. Some of you already manage your home through your mobile device. I manage my security, I manage my thermostats, and I manage my internet all through my cell phone, as do my children who actually really manage my household and the connectivity. But the key to this is IoT devices are also impacting how we're gonna shop. When do we have the heat and cooling on? What are our preferences when we come into the garage? What's gonna be on the TV when we get home? All of this is being enabled by IoT, which in turn is being enabled by 5G and cloud-based applications. We're living in a virtualized world and SDN networks are a big part of the adaptation of all of the things that we're talking about today. So data growth requires new application architectures and what we believe will enable more network traffic. We put that stat up earlier, five times mobile data growth over the next eight years. So really, as we think about where the edge is, it's really that notion where cloud, which is a software defined network and a mobile network intersect. Networks and the way customers are deploying infrastructure is evolving. We're seeing that day to day. We're seeing that with the OEMs, we're seeing it with the mobile carriers, and we're seeing it with the hyperscalers. All three of them are changing the way that they purchase, the way they design and implement infrastructure. That is a fact. So what are the future drivers, the drivers of network architecture and requirements as most of us in the room either build or own internet infrastructure, data centers, or we're building next generation fiber networks. So first, once again, I come back to this notion that the old way that we were building networks was monolithic. And now we're moving to a cloud native based series of applications that use microservices. Currently generating east to west traffic is driven by mostly machine to machine applications using containers and serverless to be clear. So as we look at that architecture and we look at how that's evolving, we also see that artificial intelligence and machine learning is also evolving. Also, once again, cloud native. Evolution of compute and disaggregated storage is also a big important part. I mentioned earlier the over 800 RAN hubs that we built for mobile carriers in the last three years. Make no mistake, a radio access network hub is an edge data center. You think about the network elements that are required to build a RAN hub and it's dedicated power, backup power, cooling, raised floors, backup cooling, security, and dense fiber. Boy, that sounds a lot like a data center. So the key to that is moving that compute and moving that network intelligence away from what we used to know. What we used to know was a very expensive switch, 100 to $200 million. Typically in a big metro area, we'd build one, two, or three switches. And all of that, all of that network capacity was backhauled to those switches. Today, we're no longer building switches. We're building a series of RAN hubs, a series of small edge data centers, where we have anywhere from as little as four radios to as many as hundreds of radios in one controlled environment, all being hosted on the cloud and all being driven towards the most optimal experience for the customer, which is using the spectral arsenal of a mobile carrier and figuring out based on artificial intelligence, what you're doing with your device at a specific time of day, at a specific location, based on your usage pattern. And once again, to laser that in, that's dissecting 700 megahertz, 900 megahertz, 1900 megahertz, 2.3 gig, using that wide arsenal of spectrum that's based on your traditional habits and what you've done to predict where they're surgically putting the spectrum at specific moments of time, front hauled from a completely software defined network. It's a complete change in how we've built networks and mobiles at the front edge of this. Size and scare, scale, it does matter. 
It requires very specific telemetry, which is why we have all these devices and sensors. And it requires high automation. And then focusing on power. Really one of the great challenges for us as an industry is how we in this room intend to be decarbonized within the next eight years. It's a major challenge. So this is all new thinking, right? It's new architecture. It's new applied learnings. It's new thinking about where the source of the compute is and disaggregating our storage and building in size and scale and trying to also do the right thing for the planet. What are the implications? Data moves. We call it data gravity. Data is constantly moving and falling into the right places. Networks need to be high performing networks. We need to continue to deploy bandwidth appropriately. Everything that we're doing is oriented towards low latency solutions. Every customer we sit with says, we need a low latency solution. We have to be highly resilient, that hasn't changed. And we have to power efficient networking with green energy. And at the end of the day, when I talk to investors and they say, what is your business intending to do over the next decade? We say, it's really simple. We're bringing mobility and cloud together across a powerful ecosystem of companies that are entirely focused on customer-driven solutions. We expect this demand where we see 5G, telco, edge, and cloud resulting in what we believe are really synergistic values at the edge of towers, data centers, optical fiber networks, and small cells that we believe will result in the creation of large infrastructure conglomerates that will provide converged digital infrastructure services. And you see this already happening today with some of our public peers in terms of American Towers movement and data centers. Some of the great moves that Equinix has made into other forms of alternative infrastructure, whether it's bare metal or whether it's software defined networks. Everyone is beginning to realize that our customers no longer purchase in singular swim lanes. You have to think bigger and you have to think more broader. We believe this is where the world's going. So I talked about it earlier, data gravity, what is that? You know, for us, it's really sort of two key areas. One is the access to compute and the other is driving latency down. So we wanna increase the access to compute and accessing you know, compute power and we wanna reduce latency. When we sit with investors, they ask us, how do you define the data center sector today? It's not an easy task. Our sector is not defined by a large paintbrush. I would offer you today that the sector actually has five sub-verticals inside of the data center space today. First and foremost, hyperscale. We define that as five megawatts to 100 megawatts of compute power. Large campuses, tier one markets. In secondary markets and tertiary markets, we believe that mid-hyper edge workloads are one megawatt to five megawatts. Going down further in the traditional enterprise co-location marketplace, we have 100 kW to one megawatt, which is enterprise co-location. And then near edge, which is what we're doing, for example, in our RAN hubs, we have you know, traditionally about 150 kW to 500 kW, near edge at sub 50 racks, and then micro edge. These are the facilities that we're building at the base of, of towers and data centers. So it's really interesting uh, from our perspective because we're defining power density to ultimately tailor to what our customers need. And as you can see, a picture's worth a thousand words, current networks, cloud native, very data center uh, centric focused, where in LTE today, we're experiencing latency in about 50 to 100. Then if you think about where we're going in a 5G evolved ecosystem, which is much more converged where we're using edge infrastructure, we're getting down to two to three milliseconds before transport. Decreasing transport latency requires moving the core of the network and cloud infrastructure closer to the customer. It's literally that simple. And at the end, what does the future look like for us? It's pretty simple. We're providing data centers at scale, at Vantage and Scala, providing that power and high density compute to availability zones and big markets. Hubs and Access Edge at Atlas Edge and Databank in tier two and tier three markets, where we're building in the periphery of the network and in the suburbs. Zeo providing that mission critical transport. And then on the edge, we have facilities like XNet, Boingo, and Vertical Bridge, which provide that IoT edge on the perimeter of the network, at the tower, at the small cell, on the Wi Fi network. All of this is highly orchestrated for one controlled outcome, delivering for customers. 
that really hasn't changed for me in 28 years. When I started building my first cell site, which was for Bell Atlantic Mobile in 1994, to most recently in the last quarter, building massive campuses for cloud players and building edge infrastructure for our mobile carriers, my mission hasn't changed. Stay focused, stay with our customers, and continue to provide great service and great facilities. At the end of the day, all of our businesses are just that simple. So I'm being told I'm being yanked off the stage. My time is up. Sorry that I couldn't be there. I look forward to being all of you soon. And I really want to thank PTC for this honor of being able to provide my, uh, my insights for whatever they're worth and being your, uh, your keynote kickoff speaker. Thanks, everybody. Have a great time. And once again, aloha.